Hi, this is Nikitansky and this is a talk about CLJ Reload. Uh, we're going to talk uh, why it is needed, how does it work, and some details, basically. Just go quickly through it. Okay, so the problem. Uh, we all love REPL enclosure, right? Um, and uh, the REPL means interactive development. So as you, as you work, you change your code, and uh, you want to see these changes applied to runtime state. That's the idea, right? So uh, the problem here is that the runtime state that you see in your application is not always the same as file state. So you change the file, but it's not always it, it doesn't immediately applies to runtime state, right? So you have to do something, and that's uh, the ultimate question: How do we do that? So simple solution is eval, right? This is what Lisp is based on. This is like built-in solutions that Clojure provides. But the problem with eval is uh, that your data has data dependencies. So basically, uh, if you define a form or like a, a variable, right, and then the next variable depends on the first one. Uh, of course, you see it's uh, it works. But then, if you change the first one and just check what the other one equals to, it it will stay the same, right? So you only change state in one place, but everything, every piece of state that was like derived from it will not update automatically. So if you run this program again, you will see updated value. But if you just um, just do it interactively, you won't. So you have to evolve every form that depends on your form. That's basically the, the ultimate problem that we are trying to solve here. Now, uh, there is a solution uh, like slightly better than just eval, and it is eval buffer. So you can eval the whole file, right? And it works, it surprisingly well works with if you only have one file. So that's, that's basically that's the basis of Lisp, right? You have to like, because you don't have like declarations, you only have uh, code that you ex execute. So like reading your file is basically executing it form by form. If you re execute everything, it works. Uh, but unfortunately, our programs usually have multiple files. And the uh, second problem is dead code, right? So what is dead code? Basically, if you have a file like this, uh, then you comment the first definition and re-evaluate the entire file, it will still work, right? Uh, that's, that, that's a problem because now your file state is different from your runtime state. If you rerun your program, it will break because there is no definition of A. But it is still remembered because like, it's like evaluating code is additive, right? So you always add new code and never forget about the old one. So like just, just removing it like this does nothing. And it's a problem because uh, it's really easy to make mistake, and I made this mistake like many times. I committed code that didn't start like uh, from scratch, but it will. It was still working in my rep. So yeah, uh, good solution, but uh, very limited use. The second option, uh, it's also like closure always also provides this. Uh, this also built in. Um, is required with a key reload all, right? So you can do that and it will even track dependencies. So if you require a namespace, it will go and track everything that, that this namespace depends on and uh, load it in, update it in as well. Uh, but unfortunately for us, like it's eager, so it will reload everything, like uh, no matter if it's changed or not. Uh, it doesn't do unload, so the same problem with that code as uh, earlier. And it Tracks dependencies kind of in a wrong direction. Let me let me show you. So you have three namespaces: A, B, and C. Uh, B depends on A. C depends on B. Right. So like like very simple structure. Now, uh, if you require B, like say you change something in B, right, and you do require B reload all, uh, what will happen is it will reload A and B, right. Uh, but that's not what you want, right? If you change B, you don't need to reload A. You actually need to go the other way. You need to look for every namespace that depends on B and update those. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work with this key. So uh, again, uh, very limited use. Uh, I lived like that for a while. Uh, you like it? Ca you can make it work. Uh, you, only, you just need uh, one namespace that includes everything, basically, and you always reload that, and we, you will be forced force reloading reload, everything. Uh, but it, it may, can make work, right? 
Uh, but it has downsides. Uh, so uh, from these examples, we can uh, already build some requirements that what what we actually want. So we want to track dependencies. So we want what namespace depends on what, right? Which namespace depends on which. Uh, we only want to reload what's changed, if possible. So uh, only changed or depends on the code that was changed. So absolute minimum, right? There's no reason to do extra work if, if it's not required. Um, we want to reload downstream dependencies. Uh, so it's uh, like stuff that depends on me, basically. If you change me, I want to also reload stuff that depends on me. And downstream upstream is uh, it's very tricky terminology. <laughs> and maybe I'm getting it wrong, but the idea is uh, you go and update everybody that depends on you. And we want to unload before reloading. Um, this is uh, needed for, uh, well, basically to, to solve this problem with dead code, right? So you actually want to nuke everything and start um, loading from scratch. And then you see like, oh, then, then the declarations that I commented out, it, it now doesn't exist. So actually unload code, right? Um, and we, we have a solution for that. Uh, and we had it for a long time. Uh, it was created by Stuart Sierra a while, while ago, like uh, when Clojure was starting. I, I'm not sure about which year, but very, very long standing solution, right? It's called Tools Namespace. Uh, it's a library, you include it and you use it basically like this. So you have the same three namespaces, you touch B. So you have to physically edit the file. It works with file modification times, right? So you, you actually uh, do something with B. Uh, and then you call this uh, function, uh, very easy to remember, like you call refresh. And what happens is it will unload C first because C depends on B, right? Uh, it cannot unload B directly, right? Because C will depend on it. But now we don't have C, we can unload B, we can load new version of B, uh, and after that we restore like previous state, we load C as well, right? Great. So this uh, ticks all the boxes that we named, right? All four of them. Uh, perfect. Uh, and this is a great solution. I've used it again. I used it for a long time. Uh, it's like, uh, it's basically levels of progression of complexity of your project. When you just start, you start with uh, just a well buffer, and then you move into reload, uh, uh, require reload all, and then you move to tools namespace, right? And for a long time, that was the end of the road, so like top of the solution, uh, the top solution, okay? But uh, it also has some issues, right? Uh, and the issues are, for some reason, it reloads everything first time, so it's like, not incremental first time, but then it, it's fine. I uh, totally can live with that. It also reloads everything. So if you have some broken file or temporary files, or like files with some experiments lying around, tools namespace will find them and try to load them, even, even if you don't need them. Uh, if you have like many, many namespaces and you only use like four of them for your program right now, for example, it still will reload everything. So that's problem uh it doesn't support def ones so basically def ones is like built-in closure function that works with like um, eval buffer or re require reload but it doesn't work with tools namespace because tools namespace like de deletes everything and then def ones like sees like oh there's no previous version of me so i, I have to work again right um, it uh, has problems with reader tags uh, defined in your project, right? Uh, and it has no support for load, require, use, you know, just like uh, functions. Uh, might be niche. Uh, Closure Core uses load, for example, for splitting into multiple files. If your namespace is real big, might be a solution. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I also needed it, so yeah. It was real for me, very real. And uh, the biggest problem of them all, it doesn't have a cool logo. So what do we do? We write our own library, right? Meet CLJ reload. Uh, again, all same basic boxes and all the problems that we just listed with uh, tools namespace are fixed, right? I Well, <laughs> I chose them to, uh, so I can fix them and then do a presentation. So no wonder they, we have all thumbs ups and uh, even including amazing log. Okay, so tools namespace, thumbs down, CLG reload, thumbs up, okay? 
Uh, so, uh, let's see it in action. Oh, uh, so yeah, this is a slide. You see it, it says uh, demo time uh, and it should say demo time. So let's uh, yeah, hide it. Uh, the slides are actually like built in Humble UI and uh, the like uh, the way they implemented the actually closure code, uh, which is how it is <laughs> basically. But uh, this gives us opportunity to to show off, right? So uh, we don't need like separate program or something. So this is slides, and we can find demo time somewhere. Yeah, in here demo time. Right, uh, so let's go and fix it. Uh, so now we, we say file. I, I do it very explicitly. I usually use key, key, key combinations, but just so you can see it. Right, uh, then we go to, I have user namespace, um, and we have CLG reload imported here, and we have reload reload, right? So we just select it, go boom, evaluate, boom. Okay, and it took, uh, you see, like, slide is fixed, right? Uh, so I did the job. Uh, and we also can inspect what it returned. So it basically had to reload two namespaces. Uh, one was uh, humble deck main. So basically the main uh, class that starts all this nonsense and the slides files that we actually mentioned, uh, modified. And then it loaded them back and it's like in different order. It also does like uh, a CD out output. If you like use key combinations, you don't see this return value. So you see this mostly, right? So if we go and uh, modify something like more, more central, so like here, and let me reload here. So I have key combinations, but basically it's, uh, I just call this reload. And as you can see, there is more, right? So the common is like very basic namespace that everybody depends on. So to unload common, we have to unload everything first and then load it back like in topological order, basically. Okay, uh, so uh, it kind of works, right? Uh, let's see what we have to say about it. So. Uh, as you noticed, probably, hopefully, you noticed, I believe in you, you noticed it. Uh, when we reload, we reload that this slide content, our position in here stayed the same, right? The window stayed the same, like we didn't recreate the window, like window stayed where it was staying, and like the like status of all the components also stayed the same, right? Uh, and this is a very important part. So uh, the problem actually is not just reloading code correctly, right? The problem is also have a way to keep some state around, right? So we want to reload all functions for sure, like functions, uh, it's always safe and easy to reload, that's why we love uh, functional programming. But state, like some state is also okay to reload, but some state we actually want around. So that's like basis of our interactive development. We want like state like position, uh, windows and uh, stuff like that be around while also simultaneously modifying like the, the code that runs them. That's, that's basically <laughs> the tricky part. So how do we do that? Um, uh, so the simplest way is to exclude the whole namespace uh, and tools namespace has support for that. That's how I, I did my uh, interactive development for a long time. So basically the idea is you create uh, your own, you create a separate namespace uh, where you put everything that you don't want to reload, right? Uh, so it like it can be atoms like with main state and stuff like that. And you put it in, into one namespace, you put, you call disable reload inside it and it marks it for tools namespace to never reload this namespace, right? Uh, this is unfortunate here because actually, uh, so the, uh, the code reloading and your production applications are actually, should be in two different uh, buckets basically, right? So there should be a clear separation between them. So you have your production applications that like runs your code, creates windows and works, actually works. And you have your dev environment. It's some, some bit of extra code that does like REPL, starts REPL um, and does reload basically, right? And in a perfect world, your production application should know nothing about the uh, dev environment, right? Dev environment 
obviously knows about production, but, but not the other way. So you can exclude dev environment uh, at some point when shipping the application. And problem here is that uh, if you if you put the namespace like this into um, your, you have to put it in production application because you want to keep around production state, right? Um, yeah, and um, it, it leaks, so your reloading workflow leaks into your production application, and we don't like that, right? Uh, there is way to improve it. So basically, disable reload function is actually quite simple. Uh, it's not official, but like. You know, uh, we can just put what, what it does is basically puts a, a, a meta tag on namespace so you can do it directly the name is quite long but well, what can you do uh, so there's this one way right um, and the other problem with this uh, yeah yeah okay yeah, no, no, yeah this uh, this is the other way and this is a better way okay with CLJ reload, you can achieve the same. Sorry, uh, this should disappear. Yeah, uh, with CLJ reload, uh, the way you do this is during init, basically. So uh, there is a init call, like the first call when you just initialize and it scans every file and blah blah blah. Um, during that call, you can just specify which namespace you don't want to reload, right? And uh, the beauty of this is that th this happens in dev environment, right? So production code doesn't know about this. Even if state is production namespace, uh, you specify it in dev still. So like production code doesn't know about it. Great, right? Solved. Um, but, um, hmm. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> uh, the problem is, uh, with, a, with a approach like this, the problem is that you have to set, to dedicate the whole namespace just to not to be reloading. So basically, you like you have your code, you have your, like hundreds of your namespaces, each, some of them requiring some state that should be around, right? Uh, and to make reloaded workflow work, you basically have to go around, collect every piece of the state, bring them all together into one namespace or multiple. You can make multiple, but it's annoying still, right? And dedicate like so. Basically, this abstraction of loading still leaks into your code, right, and into your production code by the fact that you have to have a separate namespace. This is suboptimal, let's say. You can certainly live like that, but it is suboptimal, right? So, with CLJ reload, we thought we can make it a step further and solve this problem as well. And so what we do is you have your normal namespace. It's, it's like your normal code, like not dedicated in any sense of the world. Word. Uh, you have normal code, normal wars, but then, boom, you have def ones somewhere, right? And then like normal code again. So if you have def ones in your closure code, like just normal closure code def ones, uh, it will actually work uh, with CLJ reload automatically, right, out of the box. You don't have to do anything. There's no annotation. You don't have to put anything. There's no leak, like, of abstraction or something. You can have the, them, like, anywhere in your code and, and still. So the promise of CLJ reload will be it will unload the whole namespace, load it back again, but uh, the value of this atom will be the same, literally the same value of the atom, right? Uh, so UUID will be new because it will be like reinstantiated and recalculated, but Atom, for example, will be the same. So you can put listeners on it, watchers on it, whatever. Like you can put some value in it and it will be around still. Uh, that's the idea. And I think it, it solves this problem beautifully. Yeah, you can like upsize of diff ones. You can mix it with other code. You don't have to adapt to the reloading workflow. You just my exam in your normal namespaces you don't have to separate anything right and it finally works so like uh when closure introduced it it worked then tools namespace break it broke it uh for a while and now we fix it again basically so now there is uh, this again uh, there is a difference now between def and def ones in tools namespace there is no difference right so it makes them uh matter uh, but uh, yeah, we didn't stop here. Uh, we actually have some extra tricks. So Atom, um, you can. There's another way to make Atom stick around, or not Atom. It doesn't have to be Atom, right? It can be anywhere, actually, like random unit, whatever. Uh, you instead of writing it with def once, you can write it with CLJ reload slash keep, and uh, yeah, it basically does the same, right? So it will it will be when namespace is reloaded, it will be around. 
stepped around. But why would you do it like this? So the reason uh, is because you can actually put this uh, annotation to uh, to different stuff, right? Not only to atoms. So like there's def ones for defs, but there is no def ones for protocols, for example. Uh, and yeah, you can put it on protocols, you can put it on types, you can put it on records, and you can even with a little bit of extra work, we, we require to um, provide some um, uh, hooks, uh, you can put it on your, your custom marker as well, right? And uh, yeah, basically protocols are even more annoying than uh, atoms uh, because uh, if you redefine your protocol and you have objects implementing old versions somewhere, uh, they will stick be around but will not be compatible, and it's like the whole the whole story, right? Uh, so yeah, the way that we fix uh, this is uh, again a huge improvement. And again, like before, you just have to separate your protocol into separate namespace. Now you you don't have to do that. Um, yeah, uh, that's 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 that. Uh, now, um, wars, wars are great, right? <laughs> uh, and sometimes, yeah, all you need is just keep them around. Like, uh, but but sometimes you need a little bit extra, right? So, uh, a little bit extra is stateful resource. So. Um, uh, stuff like HTTP server, timers, thread pools, uh, DB connections, and component or mount systems, right? So these are objects that have life cycles that can be started and stopped uh, uh, on wheel, right? Uh, what we do about them? Um, yeah, uh, you can put them on var, but uh, it's like if you put web server in a var uh, and, and mark it with def ones, Right. Uh, what will happen is like world, world around this dev server will disappear, but server will be still around. So you kind of like, uh, and and new application will be like brought again, but server will be old, and somehow you need to pass like new value of your applications, like the the, the root handler, uh, to new server. So it's it's really tricky to do, and uh, the, the the way you do it is you actually stop server and start a new one, right? And and so on with like time reset or whatever. Yeah, so you you get the idea of stateful resource. I hope. So uh, how do we do this with tool name space? Uh, tool name space uh, actually doesn't offer you a great solution. The solution is if you have if you have stateful systems, you just stop them all. You call our reload or refresh method, right? It's called refresh in there, in tool namespace, and you start everything back again. Not very cool, uh, very, very uh, overkill, right? So it's the same like problem with reload. It's, it's eager. So uh, at the point where you have to stop everything, you, you don't know yet which namespaces will be reloaded, right? Uh, and then maybe reload doesn't reload anything. So maybe you just doesn't change anything. You just decided to invoke the refresh, right? Uh, but then, like you don't know it in advance, so you still have to stop everything and then start everything back again. Uh, and this is unfortunate. So like there is no communication between between these two steps, right? So you, basically, the problem is you do extra work in this case. In CLJ reload, again, we have a better solution for this. Uh, and the solution is unload hooks, right? Uh, so uh, what you do is you write uh, your namespace, again, absolutely normal. Uh, it's called state. Uh, it, it could be like anything. Like, it's, it's not the namespace that we don't reload. It's normal namespace. Uh, you have your dev state in here, like HTTP server with start and stop methods, right? Uh, defined in with mount in this case. And what you do is uh, you just define this before an S unload function. It's a normal function. The name has to be exactly this, right? So it's like if there is a function with this name in this namespace, we will call it before unloading. So it's basically yeah, it's what it says, right? Before an S unload, this will be called, right? And, and in this function, you can well, basically like stop your server. Uh, the beauty of it is hooks are called when namespace is actually unloaded. So if you change something that doesn't touch this web server, for example, from, from the previous example, if you change something that doesn't touch it, it will not be unloaded. It will keep working, right? Because there is no reason to. Uh, the function is defined in the context of actual namespace. Again, there is like, again, uh, 
tricky moment, but uh, so because it's just a normal function in your normal namespace, right? Yeah, it's a little bit of traction leaking, but but still, because it's just a normal function, uh, you can actually reference like this var, for example, server. You can reference it here like normally, like it's just normal closure code. This function, yeah, it closes over like this var, but whatever, it's normal. It's okay. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, in case of tools namespace, like in in, in this uh, in this scenario, right, the stop all and start all will happen in the like your dev namespace. So you have to you have to like somehow reach for these values that you want to start or stop, which are in different namespace. And this namespace comes and goes, so you kind of have to resolve it again and again. And like it's a whole thing, right? Uh, but in here, like it's 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 it's, I like like it's super simple. It's like using very basic closure, like first uh, grade closure, right? So like normal, absolutely not no resolved uh, required result trigger. Okay, so uh, that's basically everything we have like on the upsides, like the benefits of using CLJ reload. Now I want to show you quickly how does it work. Um, it's basically in just just the overall algorithm, right? So uh, algorithm is as follows. So we find all closure files, right? We read and parse. Uh, so yeah, read and parse basically them uh, to to analyze and find namespace declaration forms, right? So what we need from files, like you cannot figure out dependencies just between files. You need to go inside and look for this NS form and what it requires, right? So that's that's what we do. Uh, from that, we build dependency graph. What depends on what, right? Uh, then yeah, this this is sorry, this is uh, mixed up. So the five goes before four, actually. So we figure out what changed, right? Uh, if you invoked reload uh, function, uh, we figure out what, what which files have changed. Um, we topologically sort them, so like we know, it's like we put uh, the very like leaves first for unload and last for load, basically. Then we unload every namespace, like starting with leaves, like the very top level namespaces that nobody depends on, and slowly going to the to the roots. And then we load the back again, so this way in in the different order, right? Very simple. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, surprisingly for me, I was surprised myself. Like reading and parsing closure is not a trivial task. Uh, and uh, the reason is because closure reader, uh, when you try to just read the file, it tries to interpret it a little, right? So it, it tries to to run some code, <laughs> even if you didn't ask it to. But but still, so uh, yeah, uh, this st stuff like this, uh, it's pretty trivially exploded. Uh, it's really uh, it's kind of easy to read, and. Uh, Built-in closure reader supports like two modes. I think one is leaves them uh, leaves them around to this, like so is you, you get a special object for this uh, expansion, right? Or uh, reader conditional, yeah. Uh, and the other mode is just uh, actually interpret it for like SCLJ. So like this form will be read as just one. It will be like interpreted already. That's what I'm talking about. It, so it does a little bit work. The reader itself already does a little bit of work. Uh, and, and yeah, this form is fine if you're expanding, but it's not fine if you're not expanding. And this is like the only case that I know where homoeconicity bites you in the ass. So basically, if you're not expanding this, there is a single object. This uh, reader conditional is one object. And then uh, because of it's single, uh, this map will have three values and has to be two or four, right? So yeah, uh, trouble. But if you expand it, uh, you will be like interpolating these two values uh, in place of it, and two values like bring it to four, and four is fine, basically. Uh, records gave me a little bit of trouble because Closure tried to actually uh, like instantiate them. Uh, which we don't want, so we have to stop that, right? Uh, hash tags again, uh, or called reader reader tags, right? I think they're called uh, the data readers uh, from file data readers. Yeah, again, uh, it works fine for my case, like in CLJ reload, because we use closure reader. But I think the problem, if I remember correctly, the problem with tools namespace is that tools namespace uses a separate tools.reader, I think, 
for reading closure and it has a separate pool of data readers so it, it doesn't see the data readers that you actually declared in uh, in your namespace uh, in your project and this this is this guy is also annoying again there's I feel like uh, there's like several layers of closure um, inter inter uh, like leaking into each other, right? So the, tr the problem with this, this is namespace relative keyword, right? So this keyword is actually like your current namespace slash kv, right? And the problem is like Clojure doesn't have a class for namespace relative keyword. So there's no separate type for keyword like this as is, right? It has to be expanded. Like there is no way, like the reader has to expand it to something. But because we are not ra actually running closure code, there's no namespace to expand it to. So we have to work around that. Uh, and, and there is like a hook, luckily for us to do that, but which is was tricky to find. And it's probably also exists only because somebody else once maybe run into the same problem somewhere. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy it exists, but it's very far corners of closure. And the same goes for this. Like, but here it's even trickier, right? So you don't need just like your current time space. What you need is actually aliases for your imports, uh, which is like even crazier. Which is all also is all trivial if you're actually interpreting namespaces. But if you just want to read, and you have something somewhere in your code, like it, it it's not even in the namespace form, right? But uh, because you have it somewhere in your file, it still fucks up your reading process. And yeah, it's very tricky stuff. But uh, yeah, it's it, not, nothing's too complicated. I just uh, thought that uh, it would be fun because this was definitely not something that. I will have. I expected I would have problem writing this project. Right, uh, just simple stuff. Just read closure. It's all Lisp, right? It, it should be very simple. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, and yeah, okay, yeah. There are two more. I already finished. But there are two more. Like yeah, if you have a class file or like just a class, it also tries to resolve it. But yeah, you basically have to stop it. Okay, um, def ones. Right, uh, def ones was again one of the features that we described, very useful, but it doesn't came naturally. So there is also quite a bit of involved work involved, <laughs> quite a bit of work involved. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so this algorithm again, the same algorithm, right? Uh, we actually extended with two extra steps. So five a is uh, keep stash everything every diff ones that we have right so it basically like looks for them and stashes them in a separate namespace because we are going to unload this current one we cannot rely on it so we go to separate namespace and stash them there uh, then we unload code then we read and patch files in memory so basically you read file from disk changes contents in memory and then put it into a compiler right and this compiler loads it. And this is a moment when I was happy that uh, Java has this ladder of abstraction when, like, you know, Closure Interpreter accepts abstract reader instead of, like, file. If it would be file, we have to create a temporary file and whatever. But it's just a reader, so, yeah, you can do it in memory. I was happy for that. And uh, the way it looks, it's actually kind of like this. So you have something like this in your code, what, but what we actually pass to the compiler is more like this. Like UUID is just normal def, and it references like a value from CLJ reload stash slash UUID. So that stash namespace I was talking about, right? Uh, tricky stuff to get right. Well, <laughs> tricky stuff to get right, sure, for sure. But uh, after you, this work is done, I, it just works like magic, and I'm very happy with it. It made my code uh, state management much easier. Protocols, so I don't even want to talk about. They're very, very complicated. Uh, there's lots of state kept around, and the purpose of it is not clear. So it's, it's not documented, obviously. But so, yeah, uh, that, well, I am pretty sure they work. Uh, tests are definitely passing, but maybe some very tricky edge case is, is still incorrect. Who knows? Okay, some 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 extras. Uh, we can reload by regex, right? So you write something like this: CLJ 
reload core slash reload. Usually it takes no arguments, but you can pass a regular expression and then it will find and load all the namespaces that match the description, right? And the trick is it will actually find even namespaces that are not loaded yet, plus the namespaces that are loaded but changed. So like it, it does the right thing by default. And the, yeah, the, the use case is basically, for example, you, you want to run tests, basically. Yeah, that's, that's one case I definitely know and use. Uh, you know, with, when you write closure tests, right? When you write your application, there is usually one namespace that is like top namespace that like starts web server and web server just by, by construction has to know about everything else in your program, right? Uh, but with tests, it's not like that. The tests are usually like uh, 10 separate namespaces, each, each one just testing some part of your system, right? There is no top test namespace that includes everything. And well, there is like one way to solve the problem is uh, to, to make this namespace. Uh, but if you don't want to, and it's definitely not, not the best way, thing to do, uh, you want uh, uh, <laughs> but you still want to run tests, so you, you have to find this namespace somehow, and we, we can do it for you by doing this, basically. You do, you, you load them, and then you just run tests, and it will scan every loaded namespace, basically, how it works. Find namespaces, we also expose this API, because we, we still uh, do this. We do this anyways, so, like, why not expose it, right? Uh, so if you do something interesting, you can maybe utilize it somehow. Um, return value, again, when we do reload, we return what, what was unloaded, what was loaded. So if you want, you can do some in something interesting with that. Uh, one uh, suggestion I got uh, on Closure Meetup was that you can actually implement test runner with it, right? So <laughs> it basically watches which names, which files you changed, does reload, and then you see which of the test namespaces got reloaded. And this will be exactly only uh, the namespaces that actually depends on, cha depend on uh, changed code, right? So like, this way you can figure out if you need to rerun only one test, all, all of them, or like sub, some subset, right? Because you know which files have changed and which test depends on those files directly or uh, through like this induction or how it's called. Um, indirectly, basically. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we exposed some APIs. Hopefully it will be helpful to build some other projects on top of that. That's the idea, right? Uh, we have recently Cider integration, integration emerged and uh, published. So theoretically, if you use Cider, you can try using uh, CLG Reload. I cannot give you any details because I don't use Emacs myself, but um, it should work. <laughs> from what I heard. So, yeah, give it a try. It's definitely better than tools namespace. So, yeah. The project lives on GitHub, right? Uh, we have Slack channel on Codurians, and you can ping me directly if you want to. Uh, and that's about it. I have questions, but no questions. And thank you for listening. I hope you give CLJ Reload a try. Bye bye.